something about a person who has been born again, praise and worship becomes a part of their, their lives, becomes a part of their lifestyle. And it's not, it's not an impossibility to, or a hardship to be able to enter in to praise and worship. It's, it's like a, a baseball player and a baseball bat that just becomes part of their life. It's like a basketball player and a, and a basketball court or a, 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 a rim. That, that becomes part of their life. And I've heard sports coaches in athletics say, if you're really going to be a good player, you've got you to gotta live it, eat it, breathe it, dream it. Matter of fact, I just heard something this week about languages, and they say that when you finally start dreaming dreams in another language that you're learning, that's when you know that it's actually there. So if you're dreaming dreams, and in your dream you're speaking another language, or maybe a second language, you need to understand that that's how deep it is. And there are people who wake up with a song of praise on their heart. You know what that means? It's not just a weekend hobby. There are people who wake up, and, and, and I maybe have ever heard people who pray in their sleep, people who praise the Lord in their sleep, and they're, they're just there. They are there. And I, I pray that would be all of our passion, that we would not just let this time in the presence of God become just a Sunday morning and let it grow into something more. Because God has so much. Listen, you all know what it means to be under a heaviness of darkness. You know what I'm talking about? You ever woke up one day, you just didn't know why, but you just didn't feel light. You didn't feel excited. You didn't feel joyful. There's a reason. There are things that are happening. Sometimes it's in the spiritual realm where the enemy who wants to come in and rob and steal and destroy the joy of the Lord that's ours. There can be family situations. God will lay something on your heart to, to uh, pray for somebody or cause you to, to say, Lord, what, what is this hanging on me and, and how do I address this issue? And we take it to the Lord in prayer. Remember last week, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what, when you wake up and you're feeling heavy, what do you do? Call on Jesus. <laughs> Number one, he knows what's going on. Number two, he may well have you to be a part of what's going on and be able to celebrate a victory. There's other reasons why we, why we frustrate, why we wake up sometimes and we're, we're not what we used to be or not cheery. Sometimes it's physical. You ever woke up and feel like you didn't sleep a stitch? And you knew, you, your eyes were closed all night long, but, but your mind was rolling, or, or you're achy, and you, you, you just kind of, the, I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause you to wake up in the morning, physical, relational, spiritual, emotional, all kinds of different dynamics. So what happens when you wake up and you feel like you got a good night's rest? Do you call Serta Mattress and say, I just want to say thank you so much for making this Tempur-Pedic, uh, wonder that has allowed me to sleep. Maybe you nudge your husband or wife and say, thank you for not snoring last night so I could sleep. <laughs> maybe you thank the kids or the dog or whoever. Maybe. But who really does deserve that? The Bible says the Lord gives his beloved sleep. So if you got a good night's rest, just say thank you, Jesus. Yes. And you know what? If you didn't get enough rest, I've got, a, I've got a formula. This, I'm not even going to charge you for this. When you wake up and you don't feel rested, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, says, in everything give thanks, right? For this is the will of God. So when you wake up and you don't feel rested, thank God for the, first, for the amount of rest you did get. And then because he's able to supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory, you make your request known. So it sounds something like this. Lord, I don't think I slept as much as I needed to last night. But I'm going to thank you for the rest I did get. And I'm going to pray that you will fill up what's lacking. How many of you need him to fill up what's lacking today? Amen. So some of you got a good night's rest. You just say, thank you, Jesus. Those of you that didn't get enough, Lord, you know what I need to make it through this day. You know what I need to endure through to the end. And so make up what's lacking. You know why? Because he wants you to finish strong. 
He is your number one fan when it comes to succeeding in this, this journey, in this, in this race, Paul called it. He wants you to succeed. Inevitably, we find ourselves challenged with a lot of things. Sometimes our challenges come in strange packages. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalms 107. Psalms 107 is a declaration that challenges us. We opened up with it this morning in the first three verses of Psalms chapter 107. It declares, and I'd like us to read it again together from the, the screen up here, but I want you to open your Bibles because there's some good things in here that if you allow yourself to write in your Bible, you need to underline these verses. If you uh, have space to make notes, you, you probably need to get your pen out and be ready because there are some good things for us to learn that sometimes the challenges in our life are things that draw praise out of us. They draw thanksgiving. And sometimes we have to force ourselves. Sometimes in church on Sunday morning, I, I see people forcing themselves to stay awake, forcing themselves to stay involved. And you need to realize God is with you. He is there for you. And I'm challenging us today, in this time that we are in, all the transitions taking place, all the news you heard about the government and the in, 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 uh, unsta unstable sit situation and, and the violence and the wars and the rumors of wars, all those kind of things, we are challenged at times. But I believe that even right now, with all the uncertainty, we are still a very, very blessed nation. And I believe that sometimes the, the turmoil and the trouble will cause us to forget just how blessed we are. And then we have this other aspect that wrestles our hearts, and that is how do we be thankful when we have so much to be thankful for? Prosperity in America is not the problem. It's how people handle prosperity. Read again with me, would you? Psalms chapter 107. Let's read these first three verses out loud. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're redeemed today, look at your neighbor and say so. Now that's the literal interpretation of that verse. You understand, you all are smart enough to know that's not what he's trying to get you to do. We are not to walk around and say, so, 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 so. Can you go back to verse 1? This is what the redeemed are supposed to say. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Anybody been there? Yeah. And you're not there? You can say, yeah, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was in captivity, but now I am free. And this particular psalm goes through several dynamics of life. And we need to remember, this is what the redeemed need to be saying. Not, I can't believe those legislatures. I can't believe our president. I wish this guy would do that. And I wish this neighbor would do that. And I can't believe this boss did that. That's not what the Bible says. It says, let the redeemed say, verse 1. Again, what does that say? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. I know the boss ain't right. You know the boss isn't right. Some of you know the customers aren't right. They're just trying to find a loophole. They're trying to get away. Some of you know you, as parents, you didn't do everything right. Some of you kids here know your parents aren't right. But in the midst of that whole thing, we need to remember, I am redeemed. And because I'm redeemed, what do I say? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. I hope that will be imprinted on your mind because it gets even better. Verse 3 declares, He has gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Aren't you glad that God is not just a God of the north? Aren't you glad that God knows how to walk with you when you're going south? Have you ever had a situation that you knew was going south? 
and wondered if God was with you, wondered if God was before you. Now, if you're from the South, that is, no in, in, that is no negative terminology. It's just the concept that the reality that wherever we are at and whatever direction we may be headed in life, away from God or towards God, God knows how to draw us to a very special place. And when we realize that he has drawn us from those places, the cry of our heart, the cry in our prayer should be verse 1, which says what? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The challenge before us today is not the reality of hard times, but is what do we do with all the, what do we do with praise and thanksgiving in the times of plenty? In the times where things are going good. We are entering into the harvest season. Right now, tractors and machines are pulling and plugging through fields that once were bare. And God, in his great, miraculous design, puts them into a situation where you plant this seed that doesn't look anything like the fruit. And in some cases, you plant the seed that looks exactly like the fruit, but it multiplies hundredfold, two hundredfold. You look at a kernel of grain that's planted into the, into the dirt, and out of it comes one vine. But on the top of that, the head of that could be anywhere from four to five to ten to maybe 15, 20 heads of seeds of grain. And you start figuring that out mathematically, and it wouldn't take long that if, if those plants go unchecked, this whole world would become nothing but plants, wouldn't it? If they reproduced as much as they produced, it would be an amazing scenario. So what did God do? He gave you and I appetites. We can't have all those apples reseeding themselves. I'm, we can't have all that grain reproducing unchecked. We can't have all this produce reproducing unchecked. So what did he do? He created man. And he created man with an appetite. Now, I'm not preaching on food today, but just be aware that you look at the whole thing. You look at creation. You look at what God did. And it's an amazing fact. Do you realize that the aphid uh, uh, species, these little, little bugs that get on plants, they reproduce so, so fast that if birds didn't eat something like, uh, I forget, I have to have my daughter. Come back tonight. I'm going to share with you the, the, that, that whole devotional. But do you realize that if birds didn't eat the amount of bugs, that bugs would out uh, populate us? Do you realize that God has put some checks and balances in? And you and I are checks and balances? It's because of our appetite that we harvest. It's because of our appetite. It's because of our need. God created us to be satisfied, to be fulfilled. And not only to be fulfilled physically through the creation of, of plants and animals and all these different things, but he created us with a spiritual need in our lives. And this spiritual need needs an expression. And that expression is, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. As the psalmist wrote this, he declared over and over and over again how God had done some great things. I want you to, as we read through this chapter today, I want you to consider your own life and ask yourself, where am I at? Where am I at in this whole saga? Psalms chapters 107, continuing on with verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate place. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distress. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Now that sounds like God doing something for people that they, didn't, they couldn't do for themselves. It sounds like in a person who has found themselves desolate. They have found themselves scattered. They have found themselves uh, captive in a lot of different situations. And ultimately, God steps in and says, hey, let me handle this. Because you can't handle it on your own. 
The truth is, every one of us can, can uh, remember times of being scattered. Matter of fact, we have a term today called scatterbrained. Anybody been accused of that? Anybody felt that? Anybody willing to say, yeah, that's my story? Yeah. Talking about being scatterbrained, you feel like you're multitasking just about time you get everything up in the air and going, somebody throws you another job, and boom, it all comes crashing down. Sometimes we feel banished. Sometimes it's not a matter of our own doing. It's a matter of people pushing us and people getting into our, into our space and getting into our lives and challenging us in a multitude of directions. But from the north, the south, east, and the west, when we're hungry, when we don't know what to do, when we don't know where to go, God says, hey, let me step in here. And the psalmist is saying, hey, there is people who have walked that before. You are not the first person who has ever felt like we would just described. You won't be the last person. And aren't you glad Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And if he did it for them back then, he can do it today. And you know what? If you get through this week and you're feeling all good, but next week ends up being scattered all over the place, remember he's the same not just yesterday, today, but he's the same tomorrow. He can do what he did in the past in your future. And because of that, what do we cry out? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. When I'm in the middle of those kind of situations, look at verse number eight. The psalmist dealing with people and their inability to stay focused on God's goodness says, oh, that men would give thanks. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. Now, as we walk through this chapter, you are going to see that phrase over and over. You know what that tells me? We need to be reminded over and over. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. That's why we sing songs about God's goodness. And that's why when I hear of a new song that, that puts God's goodness in a different way or a different tune or a different key or whatever it might be, I'm, I get excited about that. Why? Because you need to be reminded. Amazing Grace has been a staple of many of your worship services for many of years. Why? Because it is a constant reminder. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. His mercy endures forever. Times where you feel scattered. Time for, times where you feel overwhelmed because you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. The psalmist says, oh, that men would give thanks. Why should we give thanks? Look at verse 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry with goodness. Does he do that? Are you here to witness? Are you here to be able to say, are you here today in service, not because it's a duty, not because it's the weekend, not because it's Sunday, but because you wanted to have that opportunity to join with others who know that God satisfies the longing of my soul and you wanted to be able to declare how great is my God. Amen. Verse number 10 starts another dynamic in our, in our, in our challenges in this life. It says, in verse 10, those who sat in darkness and in shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. He brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Now I don't know where you're at today, but I know every one of us have that kind of a story. I know that sometimes we can wake up, just like I said, where there's a heaviness on us. The one thing I didn't tell you about, about this heaviness that comes on is the fact that it can be self-inflicted. And that's what the psalmist declares here. He says, listen, there are people who are in captivity. There are people who are in bondage. There are people who are in darkness because they rejected the counsel of the Lord, because they did not follow in his ways. And I know every one of us have had those situations where we can look at people and say, you know, this is my fault. We've had situations where we have found ourselves struggling and, tr and, 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 tr and troubled because of things that we can't blame anybody else for. And as hard as we try, we can't get over the pointing our finger at somebody. We can't get over the three that are pointing back at us, letting us know, you know what? This is not their 
problem. It is not their struggle. It is not their challenge. This is my fault. God says, listen, even though you've rejected me in the past, even though you've rejected me and my word and my ways and my will for your life, when you cry out to me, when you call on me, I will deliver you. And when he does that, there is a cry that comes out of our heart. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. When I got myself into trouble, he was able to bring me out. When I rejected him, he didn't reject me. When I walked away from him, he still stayed in that place where it, when I call on the name of the Lord, he heard me. And Romans tells us very clearly, right? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. We need to remember that. When things are going upside down, when we have found ourselves in a prison, we can call on the Lord and he will hear us. Once again, he reminds the congregation in that next verse. Now I just lost my place. There we go, verse 15. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You see, there's sometimes we get in trouble and we try to save ourselves. And we need to be reminded, give thanks. God is the one who has brought us from prison. God is the one who has brought us out of captivity. God has, is the one who has delivered us and caused us to stand once again with any kind of confidence, with any kind of assurance, with any kind of hope, with any kind of uh, blessed vision of a future. God has brought that. And so as we cry in the midst of those times where we remember, we remember, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Verse 16 begins another challenge in our life that we find it sometimes very difficult to give thanks in. And verse 16 declares, for he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Now I want you to realize with me that affliction can be brought on by others, but it can also be something that is physically challenged in our life. In times where I am afflicted physically, times where I am afflicted emotionally, there are times where I have transgressed against the Lord. And because of that, God's word is true. If you disobey, if you distance yourself, you are going to be vulnerable. You are going to be available to some attacks. You are going to be suspect for, for, for in, uh, uh, invitations that you don't want somebody to pick up on. There are times that you need to realize simply by opening the door of gossip, by opening the door of criticism, you are making an invitation to the enemy and his spiritual realm to come in and have effect and full-fledged uh, control of your life. And we don't understand that all the time. We think it's just innocent. We think it's just a game. We think it's just something that, something that everybody should get over. I remember years ago, my wife sharing with me the, the, the uh, definition of sarcasm. And the definition of sarcasm actually in, implies the ripping of flesh. Have you ever had somebody say something sarcastically and it just cut to the heart? Those words have power. Those words have, have life and death in them. And we got to realize that when we speak these things, as innocent as you may think they are, we need to be careful with what we say. The Bible says you, your words can be apples of gold and platters of silver, or they can be fiery darts. And we need to realize that as we walk out this life, whether we're guilty or innocent, in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of our sickness, in the midst of our, our emotional and physical weariness, there is somewhere we can go. And that is to the Lord. Let's continue to read. Verse 18, their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near the gates of hell. This is a, 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 a New King James definition of being sick to the point of death. Usually when somebody doesn't like food, there's something wrong. When your children were growing up and they said, oh, I don't feel like eating. As a mom, you knew there's a problem. 
And even as adults, when we find that we lose our appetite, we are experiencing something that is not what God created. God created you with an appetite. Now, all of you who love food should be saying, amen, preach it, Pastor Mike. Say, say it again. God created you and I with appetites. And he created us in such a way that that can be fulfilled. Now, your appetite physically is not meant to control you. Your appetite spiritually is what should control you. And there is a point where you can become spiritually satisfied. And that's what Paul says when he says, or John says when he says, may you prosper as your soul prospers. The problem with some of our, some of our Christians today is the fact that they are prospering physically, but not prospering spiritually. The epistles describe individuals who get out of balance like that. And he says, they, they, their God is their belly. And may God help us all through this time of, of prosperity not to get out of balance with that, but to realize that, you know what? When things aren't going right, whether it is prosperity or poverty, God is faithful. And in the midst of both of those extremes, I need to rise up. I need to teach myself. I need to train myself to be able to respond as a redeemed person. And what do the redeemed say? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. When I feel like I'm all scattered out and don't know where I'm at, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. When I feel like I'm in a prison, maybe it's your job, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a neighborhood, maybe it's something that's going on that you feel like, ah, oh, I'm all bound up. In the midst of that, the redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What is that so? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. And when I'm laying on my sickbed, when my body is saying I don't want food, the smell of food makes me sick, Something within me needs to still be able to rise up and declare, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Verse 20. Excuse me, verse 19. Then they cried out to the Lord. Now these, these are the people on their sickbed. They cried out to the Lord. In their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Look at verse 20. Isn't that, isn't that a good one? Read that with me, would you? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. You know what will deliver you from a spirit of heaviness? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. You know what gets your eyes off of the current economic instability in America? Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. God has sent his word. Listen, it's not something that sometimes we, we, we're always looking for a new revelation. We're always looking, you know, like in our diet plans in America. Somebody writes a book on a diet plan, it becomes a bestseller. And then somebody six months, maybe six years later, writes another book and it becomes a bestseller. What's it basically saying? We have this continual unsatisfied desire for new information. We want a quick fix. We want it done now. And we don't want to call on the Lord. We are wrestling with some of those very same things that the, that the people were wrestling back in the day this was written. Are you going to call on the Lord or not? And the psalmist says, listen, I have been scattered and I called on the Lord. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because of his good works to the children of men. I have been in a prison. I have been in captivity. I have been a prisoner without bars. And I cried unto the Lord. He heard my cry. And he delivered me. Oh, that men would give thanks unto the Lord for his good works to the children of men. I have been sick physically. I have been at the point of death. I didn't even want to eat. I hated food. I hated the smell of food, the whole thing. I have not been healthy. But when I cried unto the Lord, he sent his word. And he healed me. Let me solve your Google searches. Let me solve the time that you spend going from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. Cry out unto the Lord. 
Let him send the word. Let him send the word that will deliver you from your destructions. Verse 21, read this with me out loud, would you? Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. In the next set of challenges, we find danger. We find distress. As if being sick to the point of death isn't enough distress. As if being in a prison or, or, or scattered isn't enough distress. There is the stress and the challenge of travel. Now, in the day that this was written, understand, let me give you a little bit of history. In the day that this was written, there was a very clear picture of hell. And there was a belief out there that when you got onto the sea, that what was beneath the sea was the depths of hell. And so in this next portion of scripture, this is written by somebody who knew what it meant to be on the seas. Watch. He says in verse 22, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. That actually goes to 21. 23, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and rises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. You see, what happens sometimes, look at me real quick, what happens sometimes is when God, God allows trouble to come, tribulation, trespasses. We get all bothered at that person. The truth is, you are never more like Jesus than when you are fully trusting him in your trouble. You are never fully more like Jesus than when you are forgiving people who have trespassed against you. And you're never fully more like Jesus when you are resisting temptation when temptation is right in front of you. So who allows those things to happen? The writer in Psalm says, hey, these guys who go out on the oceans, they get to see it firsthand. They get to see the change and the transition from a calm sea where it almost looks like glass, and then all of a sudden the wind rises up. Who's the, who's the maker of the wind? God. You know what happens when you curse the wind? You know what happens when you curse the waves? You know what happens when you curse trespasses? You know what happens when you curse tribulation? You know what happens when you curse temptation? You very well may be cursing the source along with the symptom. Let us rise up in those times and be, have eyes to see. Look at what else he says in verse 24. They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and rises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. You know what that means? You ever experienced that? I'm not saying do you know what the words mean. I'm saying have you experienced, do you know that where you're at your wit's end? Things are bigger than you. Things get out of control. You, you, you reel and you roll and you go from place to place. You're, you're wandering in the midst of the storm. They reel to and fro. Verse 28. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that the waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. I remember being young. And when I was younger, I really enjoyed ha always having something to do. Go, go, go. B, B, B. Got to have noise. Got to have music. Got to have something happening. I think a few of my gray hairs are catching up to me. Because every so often, it's nice to just be quiet. And sometimes we don't enjoy the quietness and the stillness and the simplicity until we've been through a trial, till we've been through a storm. And we need to understand that if we will call out to the Lord in those times, he will hear our cry. And he can take that storm. And we see this, this was written so many years before Jesus walked on the water. So many years before Jesus was in the boat asleep while the disciples were trying to figure out how in the world they were going to survive. But they got to see firsthand that when you cry out to the Lord, 
when you call on him, when you change your focus from your captivity, from your scatteredness, when you change your focus from your sickness and from the elements around you and you begin to focus on Jesus. That's why one of my favorite life verses is, is looking unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? Because in the midst of those situations, whatever they may be, I need to have something greater than the situation. I need something greater than the scatteredness. I need something greater than my sickness. I need something greater than my, my imprisonment or my captivity. I need something greater than the distresses and the dangers of life. It is much, much needed in our day. Some of you vividly remember the incidents of 9-11. And as a result of trying to make it safer for people to fly, we have brought on a whole gamut of things. Just trying to have peace of mind about flying. Well, let me tell you, as great as all of those things are, there is something that my soul rests in that is so much greater than making sure everybody on the plane got checked. There is something greater than making sure everybody on, on, the, on the plane uh, has, has successfully completed the background check and is completely safe and is going to make the journey. And that's the name of Jesus. My confidence is not in man's ability to secure us. And as Christians, as the redeemed of the Lord, we need to really be able to say so. In the midst of every situation, it, is not, it does not have to be calm seas all the time. I do not have to be 100% healthy all the time. I do not have to be free from trouble or turmoil. I do not have to be free from temptation. Why? Because in the midst of my temptation, this psalm tells me, I cried out to the Lord and he heard my prayer. And when I declared that he is good and his mercy endures forever, he is looking. It's almost like he, he, he anticipates the opportunity to be able to step in on, on behalf of those who call him, on behalf of those who trust him. And what he wants to do in your world, in my world, in our world today is take us from this place of self-centered, selfish living where we're always consumed about this, this uh, biological situation or this economic situation or this social situation and be able to, in the midst of it, Endure to the end, all the time focusing on him and being able to say what the redeemed say. And what do the redeemed say? Psalms 107 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. The dangers and the stresses, he calms the storm. Verse 30, they are glad when it's quiet, so he guides them to their desired haven. Verse 31, read that with me out loud again. He's, he's reminding us again, isn't he? Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. As the psalmist closes this passage, reminding us of the perils of just being alive. The perils of living are the fact that you're going to have trouble. The perils of being alive in a sin-sick world is you're going to have struggles. You're going to have frustrations. You're going to have physical problems, emotional challenges. You're going to have financial, relational. It's like the old saying that says, Mama always told me there'd be days like this. She just didn't say they'd come all in one week. <laughs> But the truth is, we have troubles in our world today. And after all of that, listen to his admonition in the last parts of this chapter. 32, let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. This is where we are supposed to make it happen in our time together. When we come together, now, you may not be the elder here, but there are some elders here. So this is the word made life when we come together. In the congregation, in the assembly, when we come together, oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Now, you can go give thanks by yourself, but you can't fulfill that scripture 
without coming together. We're better together. There are some things in the Bible you cannot obey unless you're willing to come to church. There are some things you cannot fulfill in your commission or in your mission to honor the Lord as a Christian unless you are committed to an assembly. And this is one of them. To give thanks in the midst of the elders. And for the elders to give thanks in the midst of the young. Why? Because they need to see those who have gone before me know this is true. I have been in trouble. I have been tr uh, struggled. I have walked away from the Lord. And yet I called on the Lord. He heard me and he brought me back to himself. Carrying on. Verse 33. He turns rivers into a wilderness. And the water springs into dry ground. A faithful, fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He turns a wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. There he makes the hungry dwell that they may, uh, that they may establish a city for a dwelling place. And sow fields and plant vineyards that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He blesses them and they might multiply greatly. He does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in wilderness where there is no way. Ah, whole bunch of stuff in there. And let me just try to unpack it by saying this. The same God who has the ability to cause us to prosper can just as easily lead people into, pro into poverty. And that doesn't rest well with America's model of success. Doesn't rest well with America's idea of even, even the Christian world. Why would God lead me into a troubled time? Why would God lead me into a time where there is trespasses? The psalmist sees in this particular uh, psalm, he says, hey, listen, the God who can take a fruitful land and turn it into a barren can also take a barren land and turn it into fruitfulness. I hope you understand now why I say prosperity is not the problem in America and neither is poverty. The problem in America and the problem around our world is not the condition or the income that we have. It is not the amount that we own. It is who owns us. Who owns us in this world of plenty? Who owns you in America? And whoever you fear, you will honor. We heard that throughout the summer. The truth is, if you fear the economy, you will honor the economy. If you fear pro pro poverty, you actually honor poverty. If you fear prosperity, you will honor prosperity. Why? Because you become what you focus on. And what you focus on has the ability to consume you. And that's why as redeemed people of the Lord, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? Because years and years and years ago, the psalmist said, listen, I know what it means to be sick. I know what it means to trespass against the Lord and walk away and, and be in my own bondage. I know what it means to be in troubled times. I know what it means to travel on the seas and, and experience the greatness of nature. And ultimately, in the midst of everything, I know what it means to call on the name of the Lord and hear peace be still. This psalm declares that you may have it good right now, but it may not always be good. The psalmist declares you may have it bad right now, but it won't always be bad. My dad used to tell me when sometimes I'd call him and I'd say, man, I'm really sick. He'd say, well, just remember what Jesus said. It came to pass. <laughs> and we need to realize that. That when I'm feeling really good, when everything's going great and I've got the money I need, people love me, people like me, everything's going like it's supposed to go, this too shall pass. When people don't like me and I don't have enough money and I don't know where the next thing's coming, this too shall pass. Why? Because the God who can, who can bring prosperity out of poverty can also take us from prosperity to poverty. All that he may be glorified and we may be satisfied. Look at verse 40. He pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. 
People who have it all together all of a sudden don't got it all together. People who had the world by the tail and then, man, they were just in charge. All of a sudden, they're wandering around wondering, where am I going to eat next? I've lived long enough, and, and you have too, to see people who went from rags to riches. And the people who went from riches to rags. And yet in the midst of it, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Lord is good. Give thanks for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Verse 41. He sets the poor on high, far from affliction, and makes their families like a flock. Does God care about poverty? No. He cares about people in poverty. And this is where we have got to have a renewed mind. This is where we got to change our situations from looking at them as the world looks at them and being able to focus in on how God sees them. God is not scared of poverty. God is not scared of prosperity. God is not scared of the atheist who acts like there is no God but can't answer the question where he came from. God is not scared of the president. He put him there. God is not scared of the devil. Can, can, I, can I meddle here just a little bit? <laughs> Some of the things we are scared of, he conquered on the cross. God is not scared of an economic government shutdown. Is that okay to say? I, 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 and please, please hear me. I am not saying that out of insensitivity because I realize that there's going to be some families who are going to find themselves realizing just how much confidence they had on the government. On man's attempt to supply them with the basics of life. A job. Income. But hear me, God is not afraid of our government shutting down. And if God isn't afraid of that, how should the redeemed of the Lord respond? What does it say when we are afraid or we are tolerating things that God doesn't tolerate? Can I tell you, that is why some of the people in America look at Christianity and say they don't have time for it, is because there is an inconsistency between this great, big, wonderful God who can do all things and there is no fear and all confidence and his people who are saying, who are we going to trust? God is not afraid of AIDS. God is not afraid of immorality. He doesn't like it. He will judge it. God is not afraid of a person who chooses an alternate lifestyle. God is not afraid of the person who chooses to swear and use his name in vain. As Christians... Our response, our mind should be the same as that of Christ. Let me finish. The righteous see it. What do they see? What's the it? Everything else listed above. They see that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. They see that in trouble and sorrow and temptation and struggles and the danger of travel on the seas and the danger of traveling in the air. We see all of these things, but the righteous rejoice in it. Now, let me share with you, there are a couple of ways you need to rejoice. Here's one way not to rejoice. When the government fails, don't 
as a Christian, walk out and say, na 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 I could have told you. That is not how we rejoice. We do not rejoice at someone else's failure. We do not rejoice in someone else's sin, in someone else's hardship. The proverb says, be careful when you rejoice over somebody else's stumbling. Because the God who saw you rejoice may very well bring you through the same trial. The righteous rejoice in the storm. Why? Because God is greater. The righteous rejoice in our trouble. Why? Because God is greater. The righteous rejoice when things go from good to bad. Not because, well, you deserve it. Finally, you're getting what you got coming. No, we rejoice because God has not given up. And if he will cry out to the Lord, if she will cry out to the Lord, he will hear their cry and he will redeem them and they will be able to stand and declare in the assembly, in the congregation, among the elders, how great is our God. Give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. So who stole your joy last week? Who kept you from rejoicing last week? You want to know the answer? We did. It was for freedom that we have been set free. Do you realize that when we tolerate complaining, and I'm not talking about other people complaining, I'm talking about us complaining. When we tolerate complaining, when we tolerate grumbling, when we tolerate these things and we allow it to affect our lives, we ultimately refuse to say what the Bible says when it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's why Paul said, I bring my body under subjection in 1 Corinthians 9. Lest after I have preached, I myself should become a castaway. Paul realized that it had nothing to do with the power of the cross. It had nothing to do with the power of the blood. It had nothing to do with the power in Jesus' name. It was whether or not he was going to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He was whether or not he was going to let salvation song, redemption song flood out of his life. It was whether or not he was going to keep his eyes on Christ or though he was going to get consumed by everything around him. Let the righteous rejoice in it. And all iniquity stops its mouth. Somebody needs to mark that one. Somebody needs to highlight that. You need to underline that. You want to stop the things in your life that rob you of the joy? Start putting on the garments of praise. Start putting on the word of God. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. You wouldn't believe what so-and-so did. I can't believe this guy did that. Oh, really? Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. I heard just yesterday at a training, people try to triangulate. You know what that means? It's when they try to get people to go against each other. They try to get people to use each other. And in this particular training, they told us, he says, you know what? If somebody comes up to you and they say, well, I heard so-and-so said this, you say, you know what? I need to go talk to that person. What are you doing? You're keeping yourself from getting involved in all the muck and the mire. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. He wants you this week to get so focused on everything else in this world that is wrong that you can't see what is right. And you know what God wants you to do? God wants you to go through all the muck and the mire and all the trash and the junk and the the failure and disappointment of this week and be able to, in the midst of it, just like the three Hebrew children, Lord, if I get through this week... Praise God. But if this week I die, I die in confidence that to be gone from this fleshly body is to be present with the Lord. 
Let the righteous rejoice in it. And as soon as you start to rejoice in this sin-filled, sick world that we live in, and the situations that come your way that are constantly trying to drain you and pull out of you and draw from you the life and the joy of your salvation, when you begin to rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice, it shuts up the mouth of iniquity. You ever tried to get somebody to complain with you? And they were thankful? You ever tried to get somebody to grumble with you? Be jealous with you? You ever turn some, you ever tried to get somebody, because misery loves company. Matter of fact, I'll just answer that question. We all have. And when that person responds with the mind of Christ, with the joy of the Lord, with a thanksgiving, you know what happens? There's no room. You are going to face this week challenges to where you're at. And when you do, Remember, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in it. Whatever it is this week, rejoice in it. Verse 43 wraps it all up by simply saying this. Whoever is wise will observe these things. You want to be wise? I'm talking to some senior citizens. I'm talking to some seniors today who need to realize that you may have gray hair, but you can still be foolish. You want to be wise? You want to let the, the wisdom of God flood through your life? The Bible says in the book of James, there's the wisdom of the world, and then there's the wisdom of God. This psalm declares for us a wisdom, a stability in the midst of unstable times, a way to live with generosity in a time where people are trying to grab and, and be tight-fisted and all, everybody's going into this security mode where we've got to protect what we've got because we don't know how long we're going to have it. C.S. Lewis said it so well. He said, don't let your happiness depend on things that don't last. Whoever is wise will observe these things and look at the benefit. Look at the benefit, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Where are you at today? What are you facing? As we close our time today, I want you to consider, you need to do more than just say amen. You need to be able to have an opportunity to say, where do I go from here? Each of you got a communication card. And on the back of that, it challenges you with some steps. You may be here today and you need to ask God to forgive you for the sin of grumbling, complaining, comparing, not being able to rejoice, allowing the enemy to come in with his darkness and frustrate you, ask him to forgive you. The last one out there says, be thankful for something each day this week. As we get ready in this harvest time, I want to challenge us over the next seven to eight weeks to grow in generosity. We just got done with this particular chapter that sets the stage that in everything we are at, we can rejoice. And I believe that a truly mature follower of Jesus does not just have head knowledge, can't just quote the scriptures, but lives it out. And one of the ways that ultimately lets everybody know in this world and the redeemer of your soul is your ability to let go of what God gives you to share, to give, to truly believe that give and it shall be given, to truly believe that out of my life can come more than I could ever imagine because I know the source. I'm going to challenge you in the next eight weeks. Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
try, embrace the promises. Be one of those who rejoices right where you're at. Doesn't wait for the situation to become just right so you can rejoice. As we bow our heads